Welcome back, everybody. I think you'll find this next presentation really interesting. It's Dr. Jeff Long. He's a radiation oncology physician who practices in Houma, Louisiana. Over 10 years ago, he founded the Near Death Experience Research Foundation website. And in 2010, he published his first book based on the NDEs that were left on that website. And the conclusions from uh, that study he's going to present to us right now. So please welcome Dr. Jeff Long. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, You'll probably see me grab that water every now and then. Houma, Louisiana, where I practice, is among the hottest, 90 to 95 degrees, in most humid areas of the country. And this is one of the driest, so I'm still physiologically adapting to, as, uh, as I come up here. Well, again, I really appreciate everybody's interest. We're going to uh, try to save plenty of time for questions at the end. So uh, please hold your questions until that time, and we'll make sure we have plenty of time to either answer them then, or I'll be around all the conference and be delighted to talk to people offline as well either. Well, I've got some uh, interesting things to share. Near-death experiences, I am convinced that they are real and they are evidence of the afterlife and put forward what I think were some pretty persuasive arguments about that in my first book that I published in January of this year. So let's talk all about that. Well, what is exactly a near-death experience? Fortunately, everybody here is very clear about that. Uh, however, there are some differences between different researchers about what the exact definition of a near-death experience should be. For example, in prospective studies, you really have to have documented cardiac arrest. For retrospective studies like what I did, you know, it could be something else. What I used for my research was I had to consider, if I was going to include an experience as to be considered a near-death experience, they had to be near death. Now, what I mean by near death is they had to be so physically compromised that they were generally unconscious and often clinically dead with no heartbeat and no respiration. So these were people that were truly having a close brush with death physiologically. But at the time that they were having that physiologic close brush with death, they would also have an experience. And we'll get into what the experience component of uh, what I considered a near-death experience to be very shortly. After, now that I've done, actually since my book came out and I had a mammoth number of near-death experiences, probably at this point in time I have about 2,000 near-death experiences that I've reviewed. Uh, one strike thing is that even after all those near-death experiences, no two near-death experiences that I've seen are ever the same. However, when you study large numbers of near-death experiences, you see over and over again a very consistent pattern of elements. You've heard it all, and of course people here are far more familiar than most people I've talked with, you know, about the out-of-body experience and the, you know, the tunnel, light, life review, um, often unearthly realms and the whole nine yards. So that's all. Uh, interestingly, the, the public in general, as I've discovered, as I give this talk, that for the great majority of people in the public, that's still news. So I encourage people that you get the opportunity to get the word out about near-death experience. You know, make sure you go over what happens in a typical NDE, and that would sure be appreciated. Um, well, so what on earth is a doctor sitting here talking about near-death experience? That's a little bit off the beaten path of traditional medical training and practice. Well, my first time I heard about near-death experience was actually when I was in my residency training for radiation oncology over a quarter of a century ago. And at that time I was reading the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world. So here I am in the library, flip, 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 looking for an article related to cancer, my medical specialty, and what should I find but a an article that had the term near-death experience in it. And I'd, I'd never heard about that. I went straight from medical school into residency, and believe me, I sure didn't have any time to watch TV, read books, really learn about what a lot of the public already knew back then, that near-death experiences existed. So all of a sudden I stopped and went, what is this? I mean, you're dead or you're, you're not dead? How can you, what's this near-death experience? Huh. And so uh, for almost the first time in my life, I, you know, I stopped my, my focus search for a cancer article and started reading this thing. And I was immediately fascinated. I was astounded in this article to read about how people that would be clinically dead would have these dramatic, lucid, vivid experiences, how they were consistent, seeming consistent among many, many near-death experiences that had been studied, and I was amazed. I said, how can this be? Everything I learned in medical school was that when you're dead, you're dead. When you're unconscious, 
Gee, last time I looked it up in the dictionary, unconscious, you have no possibility of a conscious experience. So how can this be possible? I knew full well as a physician with every bit of medical training I had that it was absolutely impossible to have a lucid experience at a time that you had no physical conscious process going on. So I was fascinated. Um, and, and, however, I was busy, continued studying my specialty of radiation oncology, but then the second sentinel event occurred in my life that, that opened me up to thinking about near-death experience. Now, I had a uh, uh, friend who had been in college and interestingly got out in two and a half years and he got married and he had his uh, new wife and him were back visiting me in Iowa City, Iowa. This was winter, it was just dang cold like it always is in Iowa City in, in the winter and so there's, you know, the only thing you could do is go out and have, have supper. So we were sitting here having supper and we we're talking sort of conversationally and then his wife mentioned that she had many, many very severe medical allergies, so severe in fact that at one time when she was under general anesthesia, she was administered a drug that caused an immediate cardiac arrest and she had clinically died. But she said it in kind of a funny way. And I guess thought, you know, as a physician, I said, that's weird. I, she said it funny. I mean, she, there wasn't the sense of fear in her voice or sense of, you know, let's move on. There was a sense of mystery. And so time stood still, which would literally change my life as to whether I would or would not ask a key question about what happened. And finally, you will not read this in the book. Are we on tape? Oh, what the heck. I'll tell you how this really happened. I said I had to have a backup plan. This was winter. This is Iowa. There's nothing else to do. I'd had a couple of beers. And so I said, well, you know, if I asked the stupidest question in the world about whether she had a lucid experience when she was clinically dead under general anesthesia, I'll just say, oh, good beer, whatever, let's move on. So that was my backup plan. You won't read it in the book. But anyway, that's true. So then after about 30 seconds and, and developed my backup plan, I asked what medically is the dumbest question on earth. Here she is with her heart stopped and under general anesthesia. And I went ahead and asked it. Well, did anything happen after your heart stopped? And she said, why, yes. She said, my consciousness rose above my body. I watched their frantic resuscitation efforts. And she described when the EKG, the measurement of electrical activity of the heart, when that goes flat, that makes a heck of a racket. And she described that. I knew that from the, the times I'd run codes. She described the chaos, the, the franticness. No one expected her to, to code in the operating room. Um, and yet... Uh, it did, and, 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 and she was observing it all from near the ceiling. And then she had uh, an unusual but not rare occurrence where her consciousness actually left the operating room, and from that point she was able to observe what the nurses were saying and doing in the nursing station where she had been an inpatient. And following that, she went, described going through a tunnel, described meeting deceased relatives. She had a doozy of a life review. Ultimately was asked, do you want to return to your body near the end of her near-death experience? And she said, I don't know which was her, as she put it, her old indecisive self. But after some dialogue with the beings with her, she elected to return to her body. She then was resuscitated, ended up in the intensive care unit for a few days, and then interestingly ended up back in the same nursing station that she had been at that she had observed. So she told one of the nurses, hi, uh, yeah, I'm back. Guess what? Here's what you were doing while I had coded in the operating room while under general anesthesia. You can imagine how that went off. This was way before, you know, Moody's book, and, and it was unknown. The nurses freaked, and so they did the only thing they could possibly have done. This was a Catholic hospital. They called in a nun who listened carefully and told her that uh, what had happened to her was obviously the work of the devil. You can understand her reluctance to share. I think she needed a couple beers, too. But it happened. And I said, well, you know, I, I read about this a couple of years ago. I think you had one of these near-death experiences that I didn't know anything about. And I said, let me go do a literature search. And I sent her a few articles, and she communicated with Raymond Moody. And yes, indeed, she'd had a near-death experience. Every instinct and everything I knew as a doctor said, if this happens, uh, if this is really consistently happens, if this is true, this completely changes my view of the universe and what's going on here. I mean, this is beyond medically inexplicable. And that actually began my sincere sort of process toward learning about near-death experience. Well, it was many, many years later. I'm a little bit of a computer nerd. I admit it. I, you know, set up some websites with a very primitive software we had in the 1990s. And then after setting up my professional radiation oncology website, there it is, uh, nderf.org, the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation came into being. Right off the bat, we started having a questionnaire, a survey questionnaire for near-death experiencers to complete. The current survey has an amazing 150 questions that NDEers fill out. I am, if anybody's filled that out or know anybody that has, my sincere thanks. Uh, the, the questionnaire is truly onerous, and I am astounded that so many people shared over the years and took their valuable time out to do that. 
they've really taught me and I'm turn of taking the information they've shared trying to share it with the world but that is what we have um, I say over 1300 NDEs because in my book we stopped accrual for the the research uh, at the end of December 2008 since that time the uh, popularity of uh, people sharing on the website because of their awareness with a variety of media presentations has been astounding and it's probably if, if not at it's certainly close to 2000 NDEs at the current time well it, it, in looking at near-death experiences I went back, sort of retreated back to a core scientific principle and that is what is real whatever is real in our world that we live in in our universe is going to be consistently observed through multiple observations so with just that guiding principle a web foundling website I started to take a look well um, a little bit about near-death experience just so we can all come up to speed on this here and again I apologize I know a great many of you are, are scholars and researchers in your own right but just to be sure if you're here and, 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 and less familiar with near-death experiences not everybody who has a close brush with death has a near-death experience it's only about 10 to 20 percent of people that do uh, 1982 Gallup uh, survey that was published indicated that about 5 percent of adults in the United States have had a near-death experience these are not rare experiences uh, near-death experiences can happen to children they can happen to adults believe me from people who have shared on my website they happen to physicians and scientists and we've heard from plenty of both we had near-death experiences shared from priests from ministers from religious uh, and people even people that are atheists which is interesting um, hmm. I might make a brief aside here if you don't mind me asking if is there anybody here who's an atheist that would definitely affect what I have to say here and it's really okay I we could know we would we, we, I'm sorry? What's that? You don't believe in atheists? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go get really. <laughs> hey, thanks. That was good. Okay, we don't have any atheists. Because I, um, I, I've given this, and it's been a little bit uh, controversial to some atheists, but I will tell you, right after my book came out, it, 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 my book and with evidence of the afterlife and that the reality of near-death experiences, uh, a number of atheists did take offense to it, and right after my book was published on Amazon, we had a few atheists uh, blast the book verbally, even though they'd obviously never read it. And I think some other people, I know uh, Dinesh D'Souza ran into the same thing, so watch out for that, authors. Uh, you know, atheists are, are very uh, opposed to the concept that there might be an afterlife of God and all those other things. And so the other thing that was interesting is, what I, in one of our surveys, we asked the religious background at the time of their near-death experience. And we've had several dozen people, a few dozen, say that they were atheists at the time of their near-death experience. We asked the same question, what is your religious background now? Typically, in my study, an average of about 16 years after they had their near-death experience. Of the several dozen people that said they were atheists at the time of their near-death experience, by the time they shared it years later, only one said that they were still an atheist. So it seems that near-death experiences cure atheism. And I had one... That's uh, God, uh, one atheist tell me, Dr. Long, you make it sound like a disease. So I, that's why I'm, I checked on that. So apology. And it's, I don't shoot the messenger. I just, those are just the facts. But, you know, certainly the, prof and we'll get, as you see more about near-death experiences, you could see how hard it would be to maintain an atheistic viewpoint, especially if you've had a very profound near-death experience. Even those who have never heard of a near-death experience have typical near-death experiences. Prior knowledge of a near-death experience does not seem to modify in any way what happens during the experience. Well, the bottom line is, you absolutely cannot predict by any physiological prior belief system, demographic variable that I've seen, who will or will not have a near-death experience at the time of a life-threatening event. And among those who have a near-death experience, again, based on those same demographic backgrounds, uh, gender, prior belief system, religious beliefs, lack of religious beliefs, you really can't predict what the content of the near-death experience will be with any reliability. Bottom line, anyone, anyone in this room, anyone on Earth could potentially have a near-death experience, which is real interesting. Scott? Well, a little bit more about how we did this study. Uh, NDERF uh, is an abbreviation for my website, Near Death Experience Research Foundation. When I d did this book, I was blessed with the incredible uh, background information by hundreds of, literally hundreds of people who have done prior scholarly research, and there are certainly some in this audience today, and I s extend a huge thanks. Uh, there's been a great deal many articles, great deal many books, uh, but especially cite the Handbook of Near Death Experiences, 30 Years of Investigation, which is just really a, an encyclopedia of information about 
prior research of near-death experience. So I really had an excellent background material, not only from books, journals, but from also the people here over the years lovingly talked with me about what they knew about near-death experience. Believe me, that really helped me. And the interesting thing, and while I'm not talking about uh, some really interesting findings, note that every single one of my findings have been corroborated literally with scores of prior scholarly research. I didn't invent these things that I discovered. Um, I, I, of course, had far more near-death experiences to study, but what I'm going to be sharing with you today is is heavily corroborated with the consensus of prior study. Uh, the book, yes, the evidence right here uh, is it. There it is again. It's more obvious there. Well, I felt strongly as actually a soul calling that if so many thousands of people were going to share with me over the years, I wanted to honor what they shared with me by posting it on the website so that the world could know about it. And boy, does that ever work. We have about 300 plus thousand pages read every month on the website. But, but for a long, long time, I've been aware that we could learn so much from all those questions that they filled on, that, on the survey and, and bring that knowledge to the world. And so it was truly a soul calling. When I started my practice at home in Louisiana after a couple months, uh, it really went into sort of like a mini sabbatical. I would eat, sleep, and work on this book. Uh, and I'd get up at 5, 6 in the morning and just work until I couldn't handle it anymore. I mean, it was a bit of a Spartan life. I was living in a uh, rented two-bedroom apartment, by the way. I just, you know, I was really that focused. I was really serious about doing what I could do in this book. So, but again, I, I didn't know. I'm a first book unknown author. So, you know, how would I supposed to know what would happen? Well, it was published in January 2010. Uh, it was really interesting. I was on the NBC Today show. By that afternoon, when I was roaming around the museum, the cell phone went off. Dr. Long, you know your book's up to number 11 on Amazon? And I went, oh, that's kind of a small number. And I said, wow, that's, uh, I thought to myself, I think my life changed. And it really did uh, immediately. Eight days later, it was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, and that was a very, very big deal. Um, it's been, uh, my life has just been surreal. Can you imagine millions and millions of people are going to see you and here's four huge cameras on the Today Show. I know they have their toughest person interviewing me. And 20 seconds before the live shoot starts, they say, Dr. Long, here's my first question. 15 seconds. 10, 9, everyone backs out and I go, huh, that's interesting. Well, sure. So it's been wild. It's been fun. Um, the O'Reilly factor, now that is one tough son of a gun. While I'm sitting there, I'm in the waiting room. In walks, I'm sitting there, a guy, Carl Rose in the room. Geraldo walks in. Uh, they do a satellite feed, and I see O'Reilly rip up uh, General McFarland, and I'm just sitting here. Oh, I don't belong here. And then on top of it all off of my great meat experience, as Carl Rove walks out from his interview, walks right into the room with me and says, watch out, O'Reilly's in a terrible mood. And I was about ready to, like, before I start turning, go, I'm out of here, he says, just kidding. And then he walks out. So it's been uh, interesting. Been, you know, Fox News. Interestingly, recently, a pre presentation at the New York Academy of Sciences. So it's, it's not just media. I think we're really getting to some mainstream, serious, scholarly uh, interest in the kind of research that I'm doing here. I've got um, uh, Oprah's having a new network uh, show. It's called Oprah Own. It starts in January. Look for Miracle Detectives. I've got a little bit piece there. Uh, and there's a couple of uh, major Hollywood two movies coming out, one uh, somewhat major, one very major. Um, look for the bonus material in the DVD about near-death experiences. So keep your eyes open for that later this year. We've done that. So I've been very busy doing all sorts of things here. In fact, it's, my life has started to settle down a little bit. And in my hometown in Homa, the book just went went viral. People were just fascinated with it. I think I talked to about every community group in Homa at least once, and people just loved it. They did newspaper interviews. It was shortly after the book came out, I could literally walk down the hospital hallway and have several people stop to me and say, oh, I see you. You're Dr. Long. Oh, my gosh. I heard about your book. Can you tell me about it? Can you sign this? And it was just crazy. So I'm, I'm glad things have settled down a little bit. But anyway, enough buildup. Let's talk about the book. That's what the evidence is all about. The book Evidence of the Afterlife, the Science of Near-Death Experiences, based on our inter study, uh, presents what I considered nine lines of evidence to suggest the reality of near-death experiences and their consistent message of an afterlife. And it seems that in all the people that I've talked to, there seems to be some pretty strong acceptance that this is indeed true, that, that I've only had one uh, atheist argue with me in a public website battle, and even the person who ran the website communicated with me and said, sheesh, this guy looks silly. Um, but uh, this was an atheist who wrote The Unholy Legacy of Abraham in a dramatic black and white book cover. And it's like, well, okay. 
Uh, you're all entitled to your beliefs, but whatever. It helps if they're, you can defend them with evidence. But let's, uh, without further ado, let's talk about some of these nine lines of evidence. Okay, well, a crystal clear consciousness, first line of evidence right there. To understand how amazing it is that people have lucid, clear conscious experience during near-death experiences, consider that if you have a cardiac arrest, that means your heart stops pumping blood immediately. If your heart's not pumping blood, blood stops flowing to the brain. The EEG, or electroencephalogram, a measure of brain electrical activity, it's flat after about 10 to 20 seconds. Yes, I know you may have brainstem electrical function, but that cannot explain a consistent, clear, lucid, organized experience. That is impossible. And yet, that's the time when people are describing their near-death experiences. I had studied 613 people that all uh, answered the most recent version of my website questionnaire, 150 questions, so you'll see that 613 number throughout my presentation, that's where it came from. Um, and these were all considered, I considered them to have a life-threatening event, a lucid experience during the time of that event, and they scored seven or higher on the NDE scale, that's a research scale. Um, but in my study, uh, even though these people were un generally unconscious or clinically dead, 74.4% said they had more conscious and alertness than normal, than their normal earthly life. 19.9% had normal consciousness and alertness, and only 5.7% of these people who were un generally unconscious described less consciousness and alertness. No doubt about that, generally during near-death experiences, you're gonna be at a higher level of consciousness and alertness than you're used to during your everyday life. And interestingly, near-death experiences are remembered verbatim, even when they're shared years, even decades later. We've had people share over 50 years after the NDE, and we over and over again hear how that experience that happened decades ago, they remember it more clearly than what they did last week. No doubt about that, every shred of evidence points to near-death experiences being a strikingly clear consciousness and a very special degree of consciousness that's remembered far differently than other earthly life events. But what about evidence number two? Remember we talked about, and you all know about this, you've heard a lot of near-death experiencers talk about how their consciousness floated above their body and they looked at what was going on. Well, a critical question for validating the reality of near-death experiences is, uh, is what they saw real. In my study group, about 45% of near-death experiences had an out-of-body observation in which they were able to make observations of ongoing earthly events. And bottom line is, from my research question, well, what they saw, is it real? And uh, to answer that again, there's been two good prospective studies, Sabom and Sartori, both cardiac arrest survivors. Uh, both of these uh, researchers asked these cardiac arrest survivors that had a near-death experience to describe what they saw of their own resuscitation. And for the people that did not have a near-death experience, they asked them to, to give their best guess about what their resuscitation was like. Bottom line, the people that had a near-death experience were, were typically very accurate in what they saw. Sabom even had a uh, near-death experiencer describe, now hear this, the serial number on their defibrillator. Um, that sounds like, a, yeah, any questions about the reality of that observation? But, um, that, and of course, the people that, that did not have a near-death experience describe, either said they couldn't do it or they described what they saw on TV. And by the way, I've run some, several codes. Usually what happens during a real code is not, not like TV. There's unprofessional behavior, often by doctors. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, crash parts don't mysteriously appear. And it's, it's not like often you see on TV. Um, anyway, going on to the Ender study, uh, again, the, we had 287 people that, that had uh, observations of earthly lives. I wanted to see if there was any inaccuracy. In other words, reading their accounts of what they described, looking at it from a, from a medical professional point of view, could I find anything that didn't jive, that didn't seem to be consensus reality from what I would have expected was going on? Or did they, near-death experience for themselves, say, wow, that's funny, that, that wasn't real? Well, the bottom line is 97.6% of the OBE observations in my study group had absolutely no error whatsoever in what they were describing. And what they were describing is fantastic. They would describe ongoing earthly events while unconscious or clinically dead. They would see the tops of buildings very commonly. And like the example I gave for my first NDE I heard in person, they could describe things going on far from their physical body and far outside of any physical perception. So, you know, from what I'm seeing here, there's no doubt it certainly looks like for the overwhelming majority of time, what near-death experiencers are seeing is real. Whoops. Okay, how did that work in? Oh, I snuck in a couple slides. Okay, don't worry. If you're reading this, every one of you, you're not dead. Um, but of course, you can't beat prospective studies, so you need to put a target over the operating room or emergency rooms or something. And so, um, with apologies to those that have run the studies, I'm not suggesting you use this particular um, sign 
Uh, the targets will be a little bit more sophisticated, but you know, it's certainly just a plug for prospective studies for uh, at the time of cardiac arrest. Let's uh, quickly flee this, Scott. Okay. All right. Oh yeah, line of evidence number three. Um, uh, Near-death experiences, uh, the blind. Medically speaking, you can be a little bit blind or you can be totally blind. You can be totally blind from birth or develop blindness later on in life. Obviously, the sternest test of the reality of near-death experiences would be those are totally blind from birth, those to whom vision is a complete abstraction. You cannot explain vision to somebody born totally blind in terms of the remaining four senses. I did, I interviewed the well-known blind from birth NDE or Vicky, and uh, believe me, you, you, there's no way. You, it's, it's, you can't, it's unknown and unknowable to them. And yet there have been several uh, remarkable NDEs in the blind, including those totally blind from birth that have been reported. By the way, in the book Evidence of the Afterlife, we found the first case report, as far as I know, of somebody born totally deaf, who remained totally deaf throughout their life. During their NDE, they encountered many, many people that um, were many deceased relatives, and they had the typical communication with telepathy. It was not due to him reading, not due to sign language or anything like that. It was just the classic, typical communication uh, that's, that nonverbal communication described in NDEs. By the way, this uh, totally deaf from birth NDE ear was also the first and so far only NDE ear that had a perfect 32 score on the NDE scale, which is also really interesting. But yes, for the totally blind from birth, you absolutely can have typical NDEs, typical visual things described, uh, vision which is unknown uh, prior to the, to the NDE ear prior to that time. Let's take a look at an example of these dramatic NDEs. This was shared with the Enderf website. This is uh, Marta. Uh, at the age of five, she probably should, she's uh, legally blind and she should not be roaming around a lake, but you know five-year-olds, parents, this is sound a little bit familiar. So here she is, blind, legally blind, roaming around a pond. Well, of course, she unfortunately slipped in and, and there she uh, drowned. Here's what she describes from her near-death experience. A beautiful woman dressed in a bright light pulled me out and, looking into my eyes, asked me what I wanted. I was completely satisfied and could think of nothing until it occurred to me to take a trip around the lake. I did, and saw a detail I would never have seen in real life. I could go anywhere, even to the tops of trees, by simply intending to do so. I was legally blind and, for the first time, saw leaves on trees, birds of feathers, bird's eyes, details on telephone poles and in people's backyards that were far more acute than 2020 vision. We have a small population of legally blind NDEs that have been shared with Indurf over the year. This is pretty much typical for what we're seeing. The blind during near-death experiences can see, and believe me, as a physician, I can assure you that is absolutely medically inexplicable. Oh yes, okay, time to take an interlude for skeptics. Uh, whenever you have this type of phenomenon, there could and should actually be skeptics, and I have no problems with that. I uh, encourage people to have scholarly alternative explanations for near-death experience. However, I would point out quickly that there have been over 20, if not over 30, explanations, quotation mark, of near-death experience that have been proposed over the years. These so-called explanations cover the entire gamut of every conceivable physiological, psychological, or cultural explanation for the phenomena we see as NDEs. You might say, why are there so many skeptical explanations? And the answer is simple. The skeptics themselves cannot find any one or several explanations that are so convincing to themselves as a group that they consider the case closed. And no doubt about that. The bottom line is, if you study these skeptical explanations, and believe me, I have in detail, uh, the bottom line is there's really no element of NDE can be explained by any known physiological, psychological, or cultural cause. Near-death experiences as a whole, both by individual elements, and especially when you look at the totality of the evidence, absolutely beyond any medical explanation possible. Well, let's go to line of evidence number four. Remember that example I showed you right off the bat about that lady who was under general anesthesia and coded? That got me to think. Gee whiz. Let's look at some near-death experiences that occurred under general anesthesia that were shared with the website and uh, those that in addition to that would have a cardiac arrest and let's see what we got. Well, I found 23 patients that had what I consider to be very clear-cut anesthesias, uh, so general anesthesia associated near-death experiences. Bottom line is they occur in their typical. Now, uh, I used to compare NDEs under general anesthesia to all under ND, other NDEs by looking at 33 survey questions talking about the elements of near-death experience. And the bottom line is 32 of the 33 elements 
were absolutely identical, no statistical difference between the two groups. The only difference was, interestingly, those NDEs under general anesthesia had a statistically more frequent observation of tunnels. Maybe that's due to the induction of NDE, or induction of general anesthesia, I don't know. But the key question was, what about their degree of consciousness and alertness during the experience, identical, whether they were under that deep blanket of sleep, of general anesthesia, or under an NDEs from all other circumstances. No, the anesthesia itself did not absolutely seem in any way to alter the level of consciousness during the near-death experience itself. Oh, here we go again. Oh, yes. Um, they're talking about general anesthesia. We're hoping that this is not a cause for uh, elements occurring under NDE. Ten to one that when he comes to, he'll uh, tell us one of those stories about seeing a bright light at the end of the tunnel. So when we do our uh, researchers, we do our prospective NDE, so we'll try to avoid this from happening here. Well, all right, let's moving on. Okay, what about uh, life reviews? We've alluded to that previously. That's line of evidence number five. Well, what happens during a life review? Um, you can see all or uh, portions of your prior life during the near-death experience, and you've all, you, you have been and will continue to hear near-death experiences share about that, I'm sure. I found 88 near-death experiences that talked about a life review, 14% of all NDEs. For my research question was, looking at what they described in their life review, was there any reason to doubt the reality of their observations, either for the NDEers themselves or for me personally? And the bottom line is, yeah, it's perfect playback. Of all these 88 near-death experiences, um, you know, I didn't see anything, nor did the near-death experiencers encounter any uh, life reviews that, that seemed to be unrealistic in my series based on what they shared. So the bottom line, in fact, very often they would have uh, early childhood memories and go back and check with their parents. And even if they had forgotten what they saw during their life review would later be validated. And that's just absolutely amazing. And I have to throw this in. I, I live in Homa, which is a very Catholic community. And very quickly, when I went out in the community with this talk, I had lots of people coming in, terrified that there would be a judgmental life review and that they would have done some things they ain't proud of. So I quickly hastened to add, fear not the life review. It's something that's actually very positive. It's, it's uh, intended for our benefit. I'm confident. And it's really what can be one of the most transformative parts of the near-death experiences is really not something to be afraid of. No. Uh, what about line of number six? Well, uh, we have near-death experiences that encounter, we often talk about how you encounter deceased relatives. Well, in all other states of altered consciousness, whether it's hallucinations, dreams, or anything else, uh, by far and away, you're going to find more often, you're going to remember the bank teller you did business that way, the family member you said hi to, or the doctor you last saw before you went into unconsciousness. These are living people in all other types of altered consciousness. So what about with near-death experiences? I found 84 near-death experiences that talked about encountering a being, whether I could tell clearly if that individual was alive or deceased at the time of the near-death experience. Only four, and, and I would emphasize too, essentially all the time when they uh, encounter somebody that they've known during their earthly life, it's a joyous reunion, it's not a ghostly encounter. And in my series, only 4% of the time of the near-death experiences when they encountered someone they knew on earth, was that individual definitely alive when they had their experience. Um, they may not have ever met this deceased relative. Sometimes they identify the deceased relative by looking at old pictures and family albums and recognize someone that they'd never met in their life that was deceased. Uh, it's really interesting. And one thing I regret that I didn't put in my book, deceased pets are also encountered in near-death experiences. And believe me, I got a lot of emails about that. I'll be sure to put that in my next book because it's very important to people. Same thing as with deceased uh, beings, people they knew on Earth, joyous reunions, um, the, both the people and the pets essentially always picture perfect health. And um, again, certainly a preponderance of relatives. And there was another huge study that was published by Kelly that found that same four, only 4% 4 of the time um, were the, the beings encountered alive at the time of the NDE. 96% of the time, the overwhelming percentage of the time beings encountered during NDEs were deceased at the time of the experience. Yeah, what about the mouths of babes? This is interesting. Well. Um, we accrued enough near-death experiences that we were able to actually find a, a reasonably large study group of NDEs that occurred 
At the, time, at the time, they were age five and less. The average and median age of this group was actually three and a half years old, very young group. It's really an ideal study group for studying the content of near-death experiences because to kids that young, death is an abstraction. It's unknown and unknowable. They don't understand it, even if they've heard of it, usually. Um, they've almost certainly never heard of near-death experiences at that tender young age, and even if they had, they're not going to understand what the near-death experience means. Well, again, remember those 33 elements about the content of near-death experience? The bottom line is the content of near-death experiences in this study group, age five and less, as compared to older children and adults, absolutely identical, no statistical difference whatsoever. That certainly suggests to me that cultural upbringing, what you know about death, any preconceived ideas about what a near-death experience is, death would be, or what happens when you die, doesn't seem in any way to modify the content of the near-death experience. Uh, I previously mentioned that book, um, the, the uh, Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, 30 Years of Investigation, and the, the chapter there about childhood NDEs, uh, Dr. Sutherland indicates, and, and I found the same thing, age does not in any way seem to affect the content of NDEs. Um, well, let's talk about worldwide consistency. This is one of the really interesting things. Our Near-Death Experience Research Foundation website has been translated into over 20 different non-English languages. We have hundreds of near-death experiences all over the world in languages other than English. The bottom line is, from this study all around the world, is that as best I can tell, the content of near-death experiences appears to be basically the same. And no doubt about that, we have a huge number of volunteer translators that translate. Language seems to get in the way. We have to translate the survey for them to fill it out, the questions we ask. That sometimes, I think, causes a little bit of problems. Volunteers translate the experiences and have to use, uh, you know, interpolate foreign language terms into English. But among people around the world who knew English and uh, shared the English version of the, uh, completed the English version of the Enderf website survey questionnaire, the bottom line is the content really does, the best I can tell, to be the same. And an interesting study group, we now have about three dozen non-Western near-death experiencers. At a, and, and of course, we did, some of them, about half filled out the survey and about half just shared their narrative. As best I can tell from our three dozen non-Western near-death experiences, at a, and we have them all posted on the website, by the way. If you go to non-Western near-death experiences, you can look at all three dozen or so that we have posted. The number keeps growing over time. At a minimum, I can say that the non-Western NDEs that we have the content is strikingly similar to typical Western near-death experiences, and I know other researchers are finding uh, content that, at least to me, sounds significantly different. I don't know how to resolve that paradox. That's still one of the big mysteries, and certainly non-Western near-death experiences, one of the most critical things that we need to do as researchers to get more of these near-death experiences identified and published so we can continue to learn more about that. But no doubt about that. Uh, it seems all around the world we can definitely have near-death experiences. There's at a minimum some striking similarity of near-death experiences all around the world. Implications for world peace, for understanding that we can all, regardless of our background, cultural upbringing, that we can all share these common spiritual experiences and experience them a very same way is dramatic. And I sure hope that that could someday be used as a tool for worldwide understanding and potentially world peace. And boy, do we need some of that. Well, what about changed lives? Well, especially for those of you that have had near-death experiences here, you know the impact of personally experiencing a near-death experience is dramatic. Significant, dramatic, long-lasting life changes are consistently observed in both prospective and retrospective studies. There are many, many changes following a near-death experience that have been described in many studies, but definitely what we're seeing over and over is as a group, if you have a near-death experience, and especially by the time you take some time to integrate your experience, and Dr. Atwater, I've, our findings are the same thing, it really does take about seven years or more to fully integrate these dramatic experiences into your life, no doubt that after time, as a group, increased belief in the afterlife, reduced fear of death, they increasingly value loving relationships, they become less materialistic, increased belief in God, and many, many more. Um, oh yeah, this is, this is um, here we go again. Right after I started sharing this uh, with the people in, in my hometown in Homa, right after my first presentation to this mammoth group, of this, people just were immediately fascinated with this. Someone. Um, how can I say this? Well, some um, uh, plump lady came up, a uh, quite plump lady, came up and said, Oh, Dr. Long, that is wonderful news. I won't have to worry about my weight problem in the afterlife. And I kind of went, well, um, okay. <laughs> and so uh, to commemorate that, that interesting uh, 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 result of my talk, there you go. Well, what the bottom line is, there are converging lines of evidence. It's not just one or two. 
You know, it's actually nine lines of evidence, all pointing consistently to near-death experiences being absolutely real and valid experiences. And it's not just me being the first to see this. Hundreds of scholarly articles, dozens of researchers, all finding the same thing. Near-death experiences are consistently looking like, uh, from every way you look at them, that they're real experiences. Um, the strength of multiple lines of evidence, alternative explanations for near-death experiences fail and fail miserably. This has enormous implications for science, for religion, and for all of us. And certainly, my book, my research, is nowhere near the bottom line on this. We really need further scholarly research. There certainly needs to be collaboration among a variety of academic disciplines. That's where we can really share and learn and grow about this. My next book that I'm already kind of starting to work on will be called Evidence of God. Interestingly, Evidence of the Afterlife was supposed to include a lot of material about the spiritual content of near-death experiences, about those who'd encountered God, about the decisions people made about why they would choose to lead, leave these unearthly realms and make a choice to return to their earthly life. What was really important about some of the consistent messages about what is important here on our earthly life, uh, what, what's significant, what some things that we might want to be thinking about. It just didn't seem to click with, with as the book was going on, but believe me, we'll be focusing on the spiritual content in my next book, Evidence of God. And believe me, that's going to be at least a couple years out because I'm going to have a life and do some other things in my life other than write books and, uh, uh, and, and do, et cetera. But anyway, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be exciting. This, this first book just absolutely flabbergasted me about how much interest there was in this. And uh, it's certainly been an adventure. Well, I appreciate everyone's kind attention. I'll be delighted to take any questions. Thank, thank you so much. So much, you know. I'm always saddened to hear about someone's loss, but I received literally thousands of emails after the publication of that book, and and its ability to to help the grieving, help people to understand that there really is an afterlife. I, I see so many emails from people that say, "Is the one that I loved who died? Are they okay?" Boy, you could carry this message forward. People read this book, and I think it really helps them understand. Not only is there one that they loved and and died, not only are they okay. But to put it frankly, they're in a much better place than any one of us. And I think that's reassuring to many. Thank you for sharing that. One other point on that is one of your last points was the need to do more scholarly mm -hmm. research. And I guess maybe I'm asking to, to put another challenge on you, uh, taking the evidence you've collected to help push our educational system yeah. for formal training across the board for all medical professionals. I think that's a really good point. I think the, the evidence for the reality of, of an afterlife of God, certainly for the reality of near-death experiences, is really reaching the point where it's so strong that I think you really need to be thinking about that and actually incorporating that into educational material. I mean, look at that. Five percent of adults are going to have near-death experiences. These aren't rare events. I think the more people know about that, the more people understand their real experiences of profound significance and meaning. And I think that's going to help the people that have them. It's going to encourage them to share it, and I'm convinced, as I'm sure you are, it would make a better world. Well, that's great. Good luck with your next book, but okay. I'm looking for help on that educational issue. Yeah, look, look me up offline. I'd be glad to do what I can. Thanks. My question is, uh, did, uh, on your website, did you get a lot of experiences that were similar to your death experiences that occurred in times of the other Americans with death? Yeah, oh, yeah. We get uh, only about half the experiences that I got 
were considered uh, to meeting our research definition of near-death experiences. We get everything. We get life-threatening events with no experience, after-death communications, spontaneous out-of-body experiences. And unfortunately, over and over, we get experiences where you say, wow, that was probably a near-death experience. But they just didn't document you know, their life-threatening event, the ability that, to know that they were unconscious. Uh, we thought the, the, to, to do this properly, we would call them probable near-death experiences. It wasn't convincing enough to put, uh, to analyze as near-death experiences, but we now our policy is to post every single probable near-death experience. So it's very clear to the world where we draw the line, I think. But a good question. Yes? You mentioned pets. When there's contact in a near-death experience with a pet, is telepathy available for communication? Oh, that's interesting. Um, oh, that's it. So it's like telepathic communication, like communication with deceased uh, loved ones, uh, people they knew on Earth. I have not, you know, I haven't studied that formally, so I'm a little hesitant to talk about that. But my just my impression is there's sort of a, it's a joyous reunion. There seems to be a sharing. I mean, they're, they're certainly sharing at some level, but I just don't see many, you know, kind of high level communications, you know, like you'd communicate with a person, which is an interesting, interesting point. Now, within the, within the uh, life of your experience, have, have you had any people speak of uh, experiencing the effects that they had on other people? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's very common. Uh, in the panoramic life review, especially those that see all of their prior life, it is, it is relatively common in that group of, of, of life reviews that they not only are aware of their interactions, they can see and understand their interactions with other people, but in addition to that, they can feel and understand what that other person felt like while they were interacting with them. And that can be dramatic, and, and uh, uh, certainly that does happen, and that, that happened. We got a lot of experiences like that. Again, it's one of the most profoundly transformative things. People really understand how they impacted other people uh, very dramatically through first-person experience. Can we extrapolate on that that we should be good to other people in order to feel the joy that we create? I think there's a variety of reasons to be good to other people, but I think that would be... Uh, um, you know, I think that would be one that you would think about. I would hope everyone would be good to other people just because that's the right thing to do. But, uh, you know, that's certainly a thought. I, um, yeah, it's an interesting way to look at it. Last question. I'm not a skeptic, but if I were a skeptic, I would take a devil's advocate position and ask this about the, the NDE with the child, the divine child from birth, uh, who saw the woman dressed in white. Uh, if I were a skeptic, I would ask, how would a child born from birth know what white means? Oh, right. That person, I would emphasize, that person was legally blind. And, and as I mentioned, there's whole gradations of how blind you are. Uh, even legally blind people can be blind for a lot of reasons. If you have a very limited range of view, you're legally blind. If you have very faint vision, you can see, but barely, you can be legally blind. So this person never represented that they were totally blind from birth. In fact, as best I can tell, this person was had enough visual faculties, at least at this point when she shared her experience, that they were able to type it. The other people that we have, a small series we have that are uh, blind, uh, appear to be, uh, in general, they have enough retained vision that they can at least type out their own experience. But the truly fully blind from birth, of course, they can't access the internet and cannot, at least by themselves, answer our survey questions. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Maggie Callum here. You mentioned your next book is going to be called Evidence of God, Spiritual Content of NDE and Related Experiences. Could you list some of the related experiences you wanted to write about? You know, I haven't got a foot comprehensive list. I'm now at this point developing an outline. Um, we have, if you go to the websites, we have a whole variety of experiences that we're going to use. In fact, one thing I'm glad that you brought that up. If anyone's had a near-death experience and has encountered God, I'm interested in talking with you. Will you be doing any of the experiences that are already identified as near-death awareness? Uh, I haven't made up my mind about that. Okay. Okay. If you do, would you please use the research that's already been done to give credit for it? If we do, we will, if we use, quote, any scholarly source, we'll be delighted to do that. Thank you, John. Hi. Um, regarding creating a better world, yes. uh, which I'm very interested in, um, what's your understanding from the study of near-death experiences as far as what is predestined? 
Oh, that's free will. will. Is everything the way it's supposed to be? Or is is a person's life predestined? Yeah, that is a good question. If anyone's got, see, that's that hits right down to some of the real cores. You know, we, we it clearly, as a lot of people know, there's a lot of near-death experiences that are that talk openly about pre-mortal existence. In other words, awareness of a non-earthly existence prior to our earthly life. Decisions about coming down here. Importance of the lessons, um, and 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 how those lessons play out. What see, and there's there's some. Some near-death experiences that will suggest there's uh, a fairly substantial amount of our life that is sort of, you know, predestined or planned to create those lessons. And other near-death experiences where you kind of come away with the impression of, you know, it seems to be more uh, random and less predestined. I sure don't have that figure out. If anybody's got some some insights on that, I'd like to hear about that. Because that's, to me, one of the great mysteries I'm uh, wrestling with as I go through these. I don't have a good answer on that. And that is a very important question. So glad you brought it up. I wish, wish I had. Thank you. I just, you know, have spiritual friends who say, "Please stop trying to make the world better. It's, it's everything's the way it's supposed to be." And so that's my, my question. Comes from yeah, yeah, and I, I would have to say that what I'm seeing at a, at a minimum, what we're seeing so far, we see so consistently is the extreme. The pro, one of the more common words used in near-death experiences is love, especially with regard to loving interactions and and, and the concept of, of reaching out to others lovingly. So. You know, I would say that, and, and the concept of lessons here on Earth. So I, as best I can tell, at least for the substantial majority of us here on Earth, the lessons, especially lessons about love, especially lessons about, uh, you know, learning, knowledge, reaching out to others, uh, very, very important. And that, that certainly suggests to me that our, our entire life is not rigidly predestined. But again, I, I know that there's some mixed sentiments on that. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Long, how about putting a questionnaire on your website for veterans returning from the war mm -hmm. and their near-death experiences. Yeah. And also be the conference. And that's kind of what I yeah. just follow up with another yeah. branch to open up. Yeah. And do you have any yeah. veterans come to you that come back from this war? Yeah. Good, good question. Everybody can hear these questions, can't you? I want to make sure you heard that. Um, there was a very nice talk about veterans' near-death experiences early today, earlier today, right here. Um, I was here, uh, you know, listening to uh, Diane Corcoran and, and Mr. Kaplan talk and share his dramatic veteran near-death experience. And, and I was aware that they're talking about and aware of their interest on that. I actually relatively recently said, well, that's interesting. Let me, you know, just out of, of, of awareness that that's an important subgroup of NDEs, let me see how many combat-related NDEs I have. And I, when I did my search, and we actually have a checkbox for, on the survey for people to check if it was a combat-associated NDE. I recognize that that's a, a narrow definition of all veterans because, as, as Mr. Kaplan shared this morning, you know, he was actually in non-active, uh, you know, military engagement on a ship and had his NDE, but I was looking for just purely for combat NDEs, and I found surprisingly few, like maybe only about six or eight uh, out of the archives that I searched that were actually clearly military combat. So, you know, even with, with, with you know, reaching up to several thousand near-death experiences, we just don't have a lot of those. Um, you know, I would certainly emphasize that it's important, you know, for reasons that were discussed and very eloquently at the talk earlier today, uh, we really need to be reaching out to those veterans, let them know it's okay to share their near-death experience, um, you know, help them learn and grow from their experience and support them as well as all other near-death experiencers in any way we can. Oh, we'll try. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I love the end of cycle. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering if negative near-death experiences uh, play any role in your study and unpleasant. And, and I should also okay. perhaps even ask you this. Uh, okay. yeah, we can. Do these negative or unpleasant, unpleasant, unpleasant. near-death experiences, That's right. do any of them feature the, the deeper levels of NDEs, or do they occur in the early stage uh, 
happy. Yeah. 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 Interesting question about unpleasant near-death experiences. Thank, thank you, PMH. I, um, they're they're um, negative. It just FYI, you know, implies some type of a judgment that the that, that you know either the individual, or the experience itself is negative. And yet, even those that have unpleasant, frightening, even hellish NDEs, as we've all seen from the researchers in the field, they can have dramatic, positive, life-changing events, and that happens time and time again. So, you know, they're not really negative. They're just un darn sure unpleasant at the time they occur. Um, I uh, alluded, I have a brief writing, uh, in, uh, you know, I reference in the book I wrote that I have something on my website about, unple you know, frightening, I call them near-death experiences. And the, the number one question I've had about my book is, what about frightening NDEs? Here I am on O'Reilly with millions of people watching, and he goes, what about Hitler? Does he have an afterlife? And so I get it's an important question to a lot of people. Uh, I'm going to try, I, I, I just didn't feel I, in the first book I could address that without looking carefully at the fairly large number of, of unpleasant near-death experiences that I've accrued over the years, and I really need to, frankly, read more about what some of my uh, uh, researchers have said before me and really get a clearer understanding before I start talking about it much more. It's a very murky one. There's a, it depends on how you can define your terms. For example, you know, I've seen some people call, you know, frightening or hellish NDEs. You know, I can tell medically or what we call intensive care unit psychosis and aren't really true uh, NDEs, at least by my definition. So it's tough to find a, a you know, a clear study population. It's, it's tough to, uh, uh, you know, come to some conclusions, but I'm sure going to do the best I can on the next book so I don't have to answer a few scores of emails about people wondering about them. So I'll, that'll save me from that. I'm sure it'll probably be controversial, but so be it. Joe, yeah. can, I, can I pitch in yeah. that we, in our midst, have an expert on the frightening NDE, and that's Nancy Evans' book. Yeah, and I, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There's been some good stuff written about that. Um, I recognize I've got a huge population of frightening NDEs, unpleasant NDEs, and I'm going to hope to to use the the excellent work that's been written so far by so many people and see if I can expand on that. Yes. I'm William Flower. I congratulate you on the success of the book. I'm curious what response the media culture has been to you. Certainly, but the your response to your medical yeah. yeah, the media was just thrilled. I've, I've just, I'm still um, somewhat inundated with a lot of media requests. After the book was out, I would do several radio interviews a day for a while. I mean, it was just crazy. Um, and, and bluntly, it was disruptive to my work professionally a little bit, um, and at times more than a little bit. So I was kind of glad after a few months when that started to cool down a little bit. But the media is, is, in, is it, it, on all of you that have been in the indie arena for many years, you've seen the interest in media go up and go down and go up and go down. I, I think it's, it's more on the up now than it was you know, down a few years ago. But you know, in general, the media is interested in this. I'm seeing more and more interest in the media in, in really presenting a scholarly understanding of near-death experience that I think is, is to everybody's benefit, and so I'm, I'm happy about that. We've had some great interviews with the media, and it's been very popular. And your second part of your question was, how do my physician colleagues do it? I, I, again, I didn't get a representative sample. I only heard but from the doctors that talked with me about it, but from those that did, were fascinated, thrilled, loved it, wanted to talk about it further. I think those that were less impressed probably didn't want to talk about it with me because I could just say, fine, where was I wrong? And they know that that would put them in a bit of a bind. So, you know, sort of like the other, do the one doctor that did debate me openly on the website that, how can I say this, looks silly uh, by <laughs> others' opinions. Yes? Um, when you talk about God and the new world, are you thinking of personal God? Or is it unclear? Um, yeah, I'm just, whatever, when near-death experiencers, and it's a relatively small percent, you know, pro probably under 10, well under 10 percent, encounter what they consider to be God. This is, if it's, if it's considered by the near-death experiencer to be God, then that's good enough for me. I want to study that. And I want to, and then also the spiritual content of near-death experiences. You know, some of these deeper messages, is there something there that we can take home as a nugget of truth? You know, something that we might be thinking about as we live our earthly life. So you're kind of keeping your own personal ideas out of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I have to do that. Oh, absolutely. I'd have to, I mean, the first thing I have to do, and, I, and you're right, that's a good point. I mean, I have to just set that all aside and just say, what does the evidence say? Because it's going to be called evidence of God. It's not going to be Dr. Long's God. It's going to be the God as is described by. Boy, that'd be a boring book. I wouldn't. I wouldn't buy it either. But anyway, it'll be. Uh, it'll be what the near-death experience would say. And I think we're going to have to wrap up. We have one more question, Scott. One more. So. I was wondering if you 
was pretty much going to ask the same thing. Maybe you could have said beyond that. Would you have to ask the basis for the label of God? In other words, for them, what makes God yeah. God in yeah. the image or whatever? Yeah, and, and that, that's a real huge issue. Um, what's co conventionally thought of as God, it, what you see in near-death experience, it, you know, may be the same, it may not. God is a label. God transcends all labels, and I'm very clear on that. So um, a lot of what I'll have to do is, is look at near-death experiences where the near-death experiencer themselves has chosen the word God, and near-death experiences where this seems to be what other near-death experiences have described God, but they don't feel comfortable using that label. So it's going to be uh, interesting as I dance through that. Obviously, I'm at the very early phases of that. Well, again, thank you very much for your interest. Enjoy the rest of the conference.